Welcome to the second lecture for International Regulatory Frameworks for Climate Change and Environmental Management. So we had our introduction to the course. This is the start of our substantive lectures. We're going to dive into looking at the major international treaties since 1945. So in this lecture, we're going to look at briefly the history of a period that I'm going to say covers 1945 to 1960. And I'm going to use four periods to group together sort of steps in the evolution of major international treaties. And these aren't periods that you'll see in a textbook on modern history. I'm just using them really looking at the major treaties, when they were created and what was going on at the time, and sort of just put them together into four periods for the purposes of our course. So 1945 to 1960 is the period we're going to look at first. And what we'll find is it's a period with relatively little concern about the environment. You know, the world's recovering from World War II. There's little international environmental treaties negotiated. And then we'll move to the 1960 to 1980s, and we see there this real kindling of concern about environment at an international level, and then how that uh, translated into landmark treaties being uh, agreed, the World Heritage Convention, the Ramsar Convention, CITES and the like. And then the 1980s to the 1990s where there was really the high watermark of concern about the environment. It was a major period of transition, the hole in the ozone layer, the ozone regime in that period, um, the Brundtland Report, uh, and then 1990 to the present, because there was a, we'll, we'll see there was the Rio conference in 1992, which was this massive meeting of world leaders concerned about uh, environmental degradation and major treaties agreed, the Biodiversity Convention, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And really from 1992 onwards, we had all of the n major treaties that we currently have were in place. So I call that the modern period, but it's really just the final period when everything was in place. So we're just breaking uh, sort of history up into those periods. This isn't, of course, about modern history, but as I've said already, it's really important to understand these treaties to see them in their historic and political context. So I want to just touch upon the history and politics briefly before talking about each treaty. Okay, so. We'll talk about 1945 to 1960, then look at the United Nations Charter, 1945, the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling, and talk, I really want to use the Whaling Convention to unpack some really important principles about things like sovereignty, talk about how a treaty is created and administered. So even though the Whaling Convention, yeah, it's an important international treaty and whales are important, but in the scheme of things, it's you know not as big as many of the other treaties, but what I want to use this treaty for is to unpack some fundamental concepts and use it in that way. And so I've given you a copy of the treaty, the whole treaty, and we'll talk about things like how treaties come together, parties, terminology, and use it for that, particularly for that purpose. Okay, so as a preliminary topic, what notes should you take? And key thing is, There'll be lots of details that don't worry about writing down, okay? At the end of this course, as I said, there's an exam where you've got an essay and you basically write a paragraph on each treaty that we cover. So you might just jot down some notes about major things, but don't be worried about the detail. My own view is that in university courses, we try and cram a whole heap of useless stuff in your heads and then that you're supposed to regurgitate back in the exam and I don't want to do that. When I was an undergraduate and I did a science and a law degree, I ended up with this massive box of lecture notes that I had at the end of it. And I didn't want to give them up because I thought this is like five years of my life in this box. Um, they'll be valuable at some point. And for a couple of years, every time I moved house, I took this massive box, it was really heavy. And finally, I decided I was sick of dragging it around and it was just gathering dust. I thought, I'll go through it and I'll try and summarise each course down to one page and then I'll just bind it and, you know, there'll be this little handbook that I'll take with me. And 
so I opened up the box and you know the cockroaches ran about and dust sort of fell to one side and I pulled out these lecture notes and a lot of the courses I could vaguely make out my handwriting but that was about all that I could remember like apparently I'd passed like exams on these courses and I couldn't even remember taking them let alone any of the content like biochemistry and all of these subjects that I've got I had no idea that I had even taken them at that stage so you guys are a lot smarter than me and I'm sure your memory is a lot better than mine but I don't want to overfill you with little details I really want to tell you the story and what I would really like is at the end of this course if there is a little hook that you've got to each of the major treaties and I'm hoping to do that with the story that so say you're working in five years time and you're working for a government and an issue comes up about a wetland and you could be in anything you could be in treasury you could be in local government you could be anywhere this issue comes up about the development of this wetland and someone says there's birds on it and they're like migratory birds and you think oh I remember something about that yeah it was the Ramsar convention or something like you can easily google Ramsar if you know um, like the title and then you've got access to all of the detail about the convention so really what I want you to take away from this course is understanding the story remembering the major treaties but the details you can easily get um, you know from your phone or from a quick com computer search so don't worry about the details okay uh, as I said there's this exam question um, so basically a paragraph on each treaty is really all that you'd you know you might want to take down at the end of each lecture okay so in outline let's talk about the history then the UN Charter and the Wailing Convention so can I summarize the context of 1945 to 1960 in a couple of points. So here's a picture taken in France in 1944 and a picture of one of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima uh, and Nagasaki in August of 1945. So the context of this period, if we took ourselves back in time to 1945, uh, it's a period of post-World War II rebuilding. Like Europe had basically obliterated itself uh, the US uh, had you know, engaged in a massive post-war rebuilding exercise. Uh, rebuilding was really what this period was about. It's also a period of rapid industrial growth in the US, Australia, Europe and many parts of the world driven by major technological advances. So the research effort for the war had advanced you know, things like radar, um, nylon ropes, there were all of these new fabrics, new technologies that could be, once the war had ended, could be turned into um, new industries. During this period, government and public concern for the environment is low. There's few environmental treaties negotiated. We're going to look at some treaties, but most of them hardly use the word environment, or environment is really just a, a side issue in them. Also, there's the Chinese Revolution from 1946 to 1950, which resulted in the previous uh, Chinese government being defeated and the Communist Party um, winning power in China. So that's a major development um, in Asia. The Cold War become between the US and Russia, or I should say the, United, the USSR, um, commenced and there was a threat of nuclear war during this period. So that's just a brief summary. Can we focus on the UN Charter or perch on it for 10 minutes or so? Because it establishes the core framework for how international uh, relations uh, exist and major international bodies like um, the General Assembly and the Security Council. So let's just talk about it. Okay, so most treaties start with a preamble which describes the problem that the treaty is about solving. So you'll typically see this in any treaty. They start with a preamble. So the Charter of the United Nations coming after World War II, very much focused on that. We the peoples of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war which twice in our lifetimes has brought untold sorrow to uh, humanity. 
and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights and the dignity and worth of the human person and the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small, to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained and to promote social progress and better standards of living in, la in larger freedom. So that's the preamble, setting up the problem, why this treaty is being created. Then there's a series of articles within the um, treaty. So typically the little the parts of the treaty are called articles. So in Article 2, Paragraph 4, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. So a core part of the obligations under the UN Charter was basically don't use the threat of armed force or actually invade other countries. So obviously a core part of keeping peace in the world. And you know the emblems of the UN, the colours, the light blue, so the emblem um, shown there in the United Nations flag. Uh, the UN headquarters is in New York, so here's the big tall building. And this is another view of it. So, so there's that big tall building. And then beside it is this smaller building which is where you typically see, when you see a picture taken like at the UN General Assembly, it's within that smaller building. So I'll just go back, see the sort of dome? So if you see pictures in the news taken at the UN, it's talking about this massive hall, the UN General Assembly. And you can see there um, representatives of different countries. So under the UN Charter, each country, um, once you sign up and become a party to the UN Charter, you have one representative or one vote in the UN General Assembly. So there's 193 parties to the UN Charter. So 193 votes. And so countries big and small, so from the biggest, so China, um, India, the US, um, all the way through to the smallest countries, say Tuvalu and the like, they all have one vote. And here's a picture uh, taken you know, you commonly see that sort of picture in the news, a speaker in the General Assembly. Now, this is also a picture that's quite common to see pictures taken of the Security Council. So what is the Security Council? Does anyone know? So it was created, so the UN Charter, does anyone want to hazard a guess? So we've got the UN General Assembly, where everyone gets one vote. But there's also the UN Security Council, which is a critical part of the uh, whole mechanisms created under the UN Charter. And essentially what the Security Council can do is authorise the use of armed force against a country that threatens international peace and security. So there's only two ways, there's only two justifications for the use of armed force under international law, classically. One is self-defence, so if you are about to be invaded or attacked, or your citizens are about to be invaded or attacked, you can use proportionate response to respond. So, like if someone is firing machine guns at, you know, some of your um, people on your border, a proportionate response isn't to nuke them. A proportionate response might be to, you know, send in a small armed force to stop the machine guns being fired across your border. So self-defence is um, allowed under the UN Charter, but also if the UN Security Council authorises it. So there have been some instance, instances in recent decades where the Security Council authorised the use of armed force. One was Libya. Um, so the Security Council is made up of how many votes. So there's 193 members of the, secu of the UN. Does anyone know how many are on the Security Council? 15? Okay, and what's the special thing about the Security Council for the most powerful countries? Uh, they, have veto power. they have a veto power. Why? Um, why? 
So there are what are called five permanent members of the Security Council, which means there's ten that sort of come and go. So Australia won a seat on the Security Council a few years ago. There's five that are permanent. Yep. Yeah, great. So there's many points you've made there. Can I unpack it a little bit? So the Security Council, so mainly the UN Charter was written by, um, so this is written in 1945, it was written by the winners of World War II, essentially the big countries that won. So the five permanent members, that gives you a big guess to the five permanent members of the Security Council. So what were the big countries that won World War II? Okay, so the five permanent members are yep, the US. Let's start with the US. The United Kingdom is the second. China, yep. Russia, yep, which was the USSR at the time. And France, yep, which might think, well, um, why were they... Why did they get this special role? It's because they were part of the, you know, the winning side um, and like a big power in essentially that period. So notable absences from that are Germany, Japan. Um, you know, even though Japan is a massive economy now, Germany is a massive, you know, the powerhouse in Europe. They didn't get a seat on the permanent, on the Security Council, um, you know, core members because they had lost at the time when this was being written. So those five permanent members have got incredible power because they wrote, they wrote the way they wrote the rules was um, to, f for a vote on the Security Council to pass, um, it has to be, I think it's a majority vote, but also there are no votes against it by any of the members of the Security Council. So it's commonly referred to as their veto power. So they can veto any measure. So during the Cold War, even though you know Russia, the USSR invaded Afghanistan, um, the US invaded, well invaded, I suppose, um, Vietnam. You know the Vietnam War is occurring, which is essentially a fight between the US and so the communist forces coming down from China and then in Vietnam. So there weren't Security Council condemnations of those actions being taken because the US could block any. UN Security Council resolution about Vietnam, Russia or the USSR could block any resolutions about Afghanistan, and also they could block any about any of their um, you know, allies. So the US blocks any resolutions against, say, Israel's um, activities in the Gaza Strip um, or any attacks that Israel makes on its neighbours. The UN will, will block any resolutions against Israel. So the Security Council is, is in many ways rules written to benefit the winners. Um, and it's one of the big reasons why for all the criticisms the US makes of the UN, it will never give up the, the UN Charter because it gives it so, such power under the Security Council. So those five permanent members, even though they might criticise the UN a lot, they have incredible power to block um, uh, armed use of armed force under it. So that's the Security Council. Yes, question? You mentioned there's two reasons they can authorise force. Um, Self-defence. Self Self-defence or authorised by a resolution of the Security Council. So the UN could authorise like um, a multilateral force to go into Syria to restore peace. But who do you think would block that? Russia, Russia would block a resolution authorising a, say, European force going in. What about the Ukraine? Like, Russia has invaded, clearly invaded Ukraine and taken part of Ukraine's territory. Um, but there's no resolutions against that because, obviously, Russia's doing it. 
So they're not, you know, they will block any resolution. So incredibly powerful. Interesting little fact about um, the um, seat for um, China as well. So when this 1945, the previous um, government of China was recognised as the government of China and then it lost the Chinese Civil War. And then there was a several decades where effectively the government in um, Taiwan, um, so without, I know we've got a number of Chinese students here, so can I summarise that period as the previous government of China lost the Civil War, retreated to Taiwan and um, formed the, so there's the People's Republic of China is mainland China and the Republic of China is Taiwan, is that correct? So um, Taiwan, the government in Taiwan, the Republic of China held the seat on the Security Council up until 1971 or was it 72 when US President Nixon effectively recognised the reality that the mainland China was the more powerful and uh, recognised it and essentially pushed Taiwan, the government in Taiwan, out of its seat. So basically they got turfed out and the government of mainland China um, occupied the seat um, on the Security Council. That's a really um, simplistic summary of a very complicated part of history. Does anyone from China want to correct me on that? You're welcome to. I'm just I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just summarising it from an outsider's perspective. But essentially one government yeah, got kicked off in 1971-72 when mainland China, um, what you know in Australia we would call China um, and we would call Taiwan um, Taiwan, um, but there's a lot of sensitivities within China about that, that China regards Taiwan as a renegade province and resists any countries recognising Taiwan as an international country. So Taiwan isn't actually recognised, doesn't have a seat, isn't even recognised in the UN as a country. It's not a party to the um, UN Charter because it's basically most countries don't recognise it as a country because China um, objects strongly to that. Uh, I had a student from, we've had a number of students from Taiwan um, come and give, you, are you from Taiwan? I'm from Taiwan. Sorry, from? I'm from Taiwan. You're from Taiwan, okay. So um, a student from Taiwan um, in previous years came and said to me, well, look, I want to do a, 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 evaluate the implementation of an international treaty in my country, but the problem is we're not a party to any of these treaties. We go and we sit on them, but, and we, but we're sort of there as an observer because we can't be recognised as a party, so what can I do? And I said, well, look, just you know, explain the political situation for your country and say you know, that you're implementing the Biodiversity Convention even though you're not technically a party and bound by it. So does that, for folk from mainland China or Taiwan, does that seem like a reasonable summary? Yep. Sort of, I know it's a lot more complicated than that. But anyway, that's just one of the little, well, a bigger quirk if you're from Taiwan and China in terms of the history of the Security Council. Okay, so the current UN Secretary General is uh, Antonio Guterres. Uh, and the UN system is very complicated. You know about the General Assembly, the Security Council. Obviously, you don't need to you know, write down, this is just a sort of spaghetti map but you know, a lot of these sorts of organisations are just, you're familiar with them just from the news, like the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations Environment Program, um, a whole range of different bodies within in the UN based around the world in different cities. So um, a very big organisation. Um, the UN also has regional groups. And so there's five UN regional groups that are used to distribute membership quotas in UN bodies and leadership positions so that you don't just end up with everyone coming from the US and everyone coming from Europe um, or everyone coming from China, but there's a, essentially a distribution of quotas based on the colours that you can see there. And within that, there's um, also negotiating blocks such as the G77, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Can I just flag for you, uh, while you're 
studying, uh, you've got the opportunity uh, if you want to and you've got the financial means to go to um, be an intern at the United Nations Environment Program in New York. Um, this picture was taken by a student, um, uh, Dilva uh, Tizano, who's the second from the left and she was a student in this course um, in 2013 and she came to see me while the course was going on. This is when the, this course used to be taught in the second semester and she said, oh, I've got an opportunity to go to the, you know, uh, UNEP, I can't really do it financially, um, you know, what will I do? And I said, Dilbert, are you crazy? Go, you know? Um, and so she went and, you know, sometimes these stories can turn out really badly. Uh, this one turned out really well. She went and, I think, camped with um, a lot of the interns, you know, share a flat or something like that, and she was there uh, and gave some great experience. She was from Italy, you know, when I spoke multiple languages. She had, you know, United Nations career written all over her. Um, so she was uh, a student a few years ago. So um, you guys can do that, like particularly postgraduates, if you're enrolled in any master's program around the world, you can go and be an intern. Uh, and yeah, really valuable experience. Um, also, I just mentioned there's a, a whole range of different programs for different countries. In, for Australian students, one is Global Voices, offers opportunities to be involved in international meetings as a student. So Global Voices is limited to Australians, but you know, there'll be many programs for different countries. Uh, so Milan uh, Gandhi, um, who's, you can see I've written his name on top of him there, he was a student in this course back a few years ago and um, was heavily involved in Global Voices and went to um, one of the United Nations meetings in Peru based on funding from Global Voices. So those are the sorts of opportunities that are open to you. Can I just uh, kill a common myth that gets touted all the time that there's some sort of big government in the UN? There's no unilateral government at an international level. International law is founded on the sovereignty of individual nations. The UN doesn't have a general power to impose obligations on countries without their consent. So that's with the limited exception of maintaining international peace. So like a the UN can't impose international environmental obligations on individual countries such as China, the US, without their consent. So we talked about the UN General Assembly before. So 193 countries, everyone gets one vote. So let's just say 100 of them, so a majority, vote in favour of um, some really big steps to address climate change. And that's going to require everyone to cease using coal within five years. So, and that 100 don't include the US, don't include Russia, don't include China, but you know, all of the smaller countries, but you've got a majority vote. What's the effect of that vote on the US, China, and say Russia, and the countries that didn't vote in favor of it? Are they bound by the majority vote in the security, uh, sorry, in the General Assembly? No, countries are not bound by a vote in the Security Council. Sorry, wrong. Countries are not bound by a vote in the General Assembly, the 193 voting. Votes of the General Assembly are effectively only persuasive or they're non-binding. So there's, they can't, there's no like parliament there that imposes rules that countries don't consent to. And that's really important to understand. So most of the big treaties we'll look at, some of them are developed from the UN, but they effectively become their own system. So there's a lot of them that have UN at the start. So the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was essentially, the UN was an instigator of it, but it wasn't based on a resolution in the General Assembly. It was based on essentially establishing a treaty that parties, sorry, that countries then sign up to and ratify, and so become a party to that treaty, related to but separate from the UN General Assembly. There's another big treaty that we'll look at, UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. Again, that was instigated and facilitated by the UN, but it's its own treaty system. So. There's no unilateral government. And so when people, you know, particularly right-wing media rail against the UN bureaucracy and this, you know, idea of international government, 
it's really a, more a fiction than a fact. So international environmental regulation and generally international, general international law and politics are intertwined in ongoing territorial disputes linked to access to resources such as fisheries, oil and gas. <clears throat> Going to look at them more when we look at the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. We'll look at territorial disputes, and, but I just want to mention some of those now. So there's ongoing disputes, particularly between China and Japan, um, over these, they're called the Senkaku um, Dayatai. Can someone say the name of the islands better with, with proper accent? Say it louder. Dayayutai. And then the, um, can you say it with a, um, a friend from Taiwan? Can you say the, I think the one starting with T is the Taiwanese version of it. Is it, Cant is it just Cantons? Okay, I don't want to get too, too complicated. But each country has a different um, name for it. So see here, you've got the Senkaku, um, is what Japan calls it. Um, and then there's the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China Islands. All three countries claim it. You can see Taiwan um, there just beneath the red circle, obviously Japan to the north and China obviously off to the west. So the history of this was, um, so China had used these islands um, periodically up until the 1890s and then Japan when it, when it was expanding um, military power in the 1890s basically annexed them so took them over by force and maintained them up until 1945 when they were defeated and then under the uh, World War II peace treaty um, the US recognised them as islands belonging to Japan and at that point also importantly the UN Charter prohibited uh, countries gaining things by conquest, but they'd already been conquered at that point. It's sort of prohibited after, but the territories that had already been obtained essentially continued to be recognised. You didn't go back and rewrite 200 years of history unless, you know, leaving aside <laughs> Israel and 2,000 years of history, but leave that aside. But the basic idea is 1945, you can't conquer any more territory. Japan had already conquered those islands, and so Japan claims them as theirs. Um, as China has emerged as a superpower in the last 20 years, it's become particularly, um, you know, there's a huge history between China, Taiwan and Japan through years, well, centuries of war between the different countries. And so there's a lot of cultural baggage in the different communities. Yeah, you've got a question? That's a snake, sorry, coming your way. Did you miss it? I could give you a frog. Great question. Um, you should be showered with all this for that. <laughs> so at the moment, there's a two week period going on in Bougainville. So um, for context, so Papua New Guinea, um, many, many, many different cultures in it. Bougainville is an island, um, part of Papua New Guinea, but off the mainland, uh, where there's been a, a lot of civil unrest over decades, uh, leading to essentially it becoming an autonomous province, semi-autonomous province, but still within Papua New Guinea, and has led up to a uh, vote, a referendum on independence from Papua New Guinea. And there's, um, even within Bougainville, there's a big debate about whether um, it should split or not. If it does split, yes, it will be recognised, just as East Timor was recognised. That's not gaining, sure, there was the civil war, but now it's led to a peaceful vote. And so if the people decide to become their own country, uh, I'm sure that m countries will recognise it and it will gain a seat on the UN. Um, or oh, sorry, the UN um, General Assembly, it will sign up and become a party to it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, so the vote's going on for about two weeks. And Papua New Guinea does what is happening with China and Taiwan, so one of us will part of us, and then does it become the same? Yeah, so different situation um, with Bougainville. If it does separate, it's now being done, and hopefully it will be done in a peaceful way. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm really hopeful that Bougainville doesn't separate, uh, that it stays part of 
Papua New Guinea. Uh, but if it does, it's essentially a peaceful process that's mutually agreed within the people. And recognition of a new country doesn't necessarily, just as, I mean, Taiwan is, when we look at the principles of sovereignty, it is a self-governing area with a government that maintains its own territory. It meets all of the criteria for sovereignty under international law, but most countries don't recognise it, not because of the law, but because of the politics of it and because of China's opposition to it. So the recognition of a country is not just about the facts and the law, it's also about the politics of it. In, for Bougainville, it is highly likely that it would be recognised, just as with um, the Senkaku Islands, I mean, my view is that Japan has the strongest legal claim because it conquered the territory at a time when conquest was still a lawful way to gain territory and it has maintained its claim to that, so it's got sovereignty. Um, China will never recognise that though because, you know, for a whole range of reasons, once the resources, there's all the historic baggage of, you know, wars and cultural differences with China. So China and Japan are never going to uh, mutually agree that the other is right. And similarly, there's a whole problem with Taiwan. You know, it also claims and it's not going to be recognised by either of them. So a few years ago, uh, I mean, in the recent years, as we'll look at in UNCLOS, there's a much bigger fight about the South China Sea. We'll look at that in UNCLOS lecture. But um, back 10 years ago, there was a lot of concern that um, there was increased patrols from Japan and China of the area and you know, fighters flying by each other and there was a real concern that it would spark a um, war between Japan and China and a lot of, you'd see on the news like um, protests against the other country in, in the different countries. So, um, and this is just, I won't play the lecture, but this was a news report um, about possible war over the islands. Um, can I just mention a side note on the use of armed force? Article 51, um, I mentioned self-defence is one reason you can use um, armed force against another country. So there is a recognition of self-defence. The only other exception is if it's recognised by the Security Council or authorised. So self-defence must be proportionate. So you can't, as I said, if someone fires a machine gun at your people or your soldiers across the border, you can't then go and, you know, do a mass scale bombing of, you know, the cities and wipe them out entirely. That would be disproportionate to what is required for self-defence. But if they say fired bullets at you across the border, you could go into their territory to destroy the machine guns that were firing at you. Let's just use that as a, as a sort of example. Um, what about these though? So you see in the news for the last um, decade or so, the US has been killing people, um, assassinating um, people that it says are terrorists in a range of countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, often without the consent of those countries for them to be killing people in them. So it's a use of armed force. It doesn't actually meet the criteria for self-defense because there's no preemptive self-defense. Even though you think the person is a terrorist and they are planning some, you know, some attack. It has to be imminent and it has to be a response to an imminent threat. You can't just go in and target someone who's a leader of a group. So it doesn't actually meet the criteria for self-defense. It's not authorised by the Security Council. Is it lawful? Yep, yeah, well, so there's civ let's civilians that are killed along the way, you know, if they blow up a wedding by mistake and 100 um, people and 50 children are killed. Um, but, you know, they would say, well, they were going after a terrorist. You know, but even if they were just going after a terrorist or someone that they said, it wouldn't be self-defence, typically. Um, so it actually doesn't meet the exceptions for when you can use armed force in another country and it's not authorised. So under international law, the simple answer is it's actually unlawful. Um, but the US gets away with it, why? They're a superpower and they've got so many tanks and planes and stuff, they can basically destroy anyone that stands in their way. So it does it because it can, not because it's lawful. Okay, 
So that's a UN Charter. Important points to um, understand from that, and uh, particularly the, you know, the basic elements of the UN system, the UN General Assembly, the Security Council, that essentially there's no unilateral government at an international level. And that's laying the foundation for us to then go on, you now go on and consider other treaties. So I'm going to go on to look at the International Whaling Convention. And as I said, we're going to use this to look at some really core components of the international system. But it's been about 50 minutes since we started. I want to regularly just take breaks about every 50 minutes. So why don't we take a break, take 10 minutes, and uh, get up, stretch your legs, uh, have another coffee or tea, or go and get some water if you need to go to the loo. Um, and we'll Welcome back to the second half of our lecture. We were looking at the UN Charter before we broke. We're going to move on to look at the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling, signed in 1946. And I want to use a case study in it of recent whaling around Antarctica. And I reiterate that we're really looking at this topic not for the specifics of the Whaling Convention, but also to unpack some of the really important fundamental concepts that underlie all the other treaties that we look at and uh, the, you know, the system of uh, international law generally. So things like sovereignty, the process for creating and administering a treaty, uh, and the like, and how you interpret a treaty. So that's what the real focus of this lecture is on. OK, so thinking of Antarctica, if you look due, you know, if you turn the Google Earth around, so you're looking straight down on Antarctica. Antarctica is commonly divided into two parts. The, you can see there um, on the, uh, in terms of the eastern and western halves of it, based on looking um, directly at it and what's in the eastern and western hemispheres. So can you see how I've got the same, as if you're looking down on Google Earth there, this map shows Antarctica in exactly the same way with uh, South America uh, and Chile coming down here on the left, and then Australia in the bottom, and then the Horn of Africa is uh, here in the top right. So the same in this map. There's uh, the bottom of South America, the, the Horn of Africa, and Australia and New Zealand down in the bottom right. So we've got our basic orientation. So the background with Antarctica is, uh, so it's different to the Arctic, isn't it? The Arctic, there's essentially floating ice and there's no land mass uh, underneath it in the Arctic. So um, we'll talk about, you know, the loss of the Arctic um, ice sheet, but, oh, sorry, the ice, Arctic sea ice. Um, but in Antarctica, it's very different. There's an actual land mass there. So it's a massive continent uh, covered in glaciers, so covered in snow and ice, um, generally. So it's really inhospitable. No one lived there. Uh, and, and then it was uh, explored uh, back in the uh, 1700s. Uh, so uh, Captain Cook from uh, England was one of the really early explorers of it and claimed um, sections of it for England uh, at the time. And then uh, Australia and New Zealand have inherited the claims that were made. Um, at the time also um, France had made a claim over Antarctica. So um, under international law at the time uh, you could claim territory that was what was called terra nullius, that is land belonging to no one. So if no one lived there and you found it you could claim it. And then if you establish effective occupation, it became your territory. So the large parts of Antarctica were claimed in accordance with the law of the time and still now. It's just that we're not finding any more land. But you know, back in the 1700s, 1800s, um, this was new, new discoveries. They claimed it for uh, their countries. And so um, in 1930s, the um, United Kingdom gave its claims to Australia 
as its nearest um, colony and also to New Zealand. And in between, there was a little French section that the English had left essentially because France had had an explorer go down and claim that section. So there's a little French claim. So there's two wedges and what they claimed was essentially areas um, between certain latitude uh, going south from 60 degrees um, to the centre or to the South Pole. So that's why they look like sort of wedges of a cake. And then underneath South America, there was a whole range of claims. So the English did the same. They claimed that area. But since then, Argentina, Argent, there's an Argentine claim and a Chilean claim, and they overlap with the British claim. And then Norway also claimed a section... Um, you can see there, that's got a really, it's different to the others, whereas the others were all sort of discrete sort of wedges. Uh, the Norwegians claimed an area and then sort of had a wavy line, sort of non-discrete, and it didn't go all the way to the centre, but that's the Norwegian, Norwegian claim. And then there was an area that no one claimed, which is this section here. So a lot of the territory was already claimed um, by the beginning of, say, last century when the major powers now, like the US, for instance, and, uh, say, Russia uh, and, say, China became interested in Antarctica. And since these areas were already claimed, and also because it was really difficult to use it anyway and in inhospitable, what the US has done is essentially refuse to recognise anyone's claims and essentially treat Antarctica as an unclaimed landmass that doesn't belong to anyone, so it's still like it's terra nullius. All of the countries that made claims made it in accordance with international law at the time, but virtually no countries um, recognise their claims of sovereignty, basically for political purposes. So US and Russia and China don't recognise those claims because if they did, it would have implications for the potential use of resources in the future. So that even though Antarctica is still really difficult to use, uh, there are potentially huge resources there if you can dig through a mile of ice. You know, the minerals and other resources that are potentially accessible there. So the, the US particularly has wanted to essentially not give up um, the ability to challenge or use parts of Antarctica. And similarly, Russia and China do the same. So uh, that's a bit of background. And similarly, Japan doesn't recognise anyone's sovereignty in Antarctica. And you might say, well, look, it's covered in ice. Doesn't that make it, uh, un you know, you can't claim it under international law? And the simple comparison is actually to apply is to Greenland, because Greenland is very similar to Antarctica in many ways. It's covered in glaciers, and lots of it's inhospitable and not occupied by anyone. Uh, but there's no problem with recognising sovereignty in um, Greenland. In fact, um, someone wants to buy it, I think. Uh, so Greenland is very similar in terms of physically. Uh, it's an actual landmass covered in snow and ice. There's also plenty of islands that actually aren't, no one lives on because they're too small or whatever. Uh, and there's no problem with recognising them in terms of countries having sovereignty over them. Um, so why does Antarctica have this special sort of in-between status? As I said, it's mainly about the politics of it. Okay, so many maps of the world show Antarctica as not being the territory of any country. So this is your, you know, your classic map of the world. All the countries of the world are in colours and then Antarctica is just white down the bottom. Now, uh, as maps often are, there's a political statement in this because it's essentially accepting the US position of Antarctica belongs to no one, therefore it's not a country, and therefore essentially it's open access to anyone. And similarly, China and Russia also want that sort of position. So there's a political message in seeing Antarctica with um, no country attached to it. So if you, this is an Australian map. So, uh, and what it shows is in mustard is Australia's maritime zones. We'll talk more about these in the uh, when we talk about the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. But essentially, if a country has sovereignty over a landmass, it is entitled to claim a 
maritime zone beside it. And within that area, it can control fisheries and oil and gas. So it's really, really powerful and valuable to a country. So around Australia, you can see uh, Australia's um, in mustard, Australia's uh, exclusive economic zone. The little bits of blue that go beyond the mustard in some places are the continental shelf. But then can you see the islands up to the um, northwest of Australia? So even though you've only got a small island, it actually gives you a massive maritime zone. So islands are really valuable. And then so also south of Australia, the islands going down towards Antarctica, all of those are claimed by Australia and recognised by virtually, I think, all countries as being Australian. But then when you get down to Antarctica, Australia, as it does for the other islands and its other external territories, it claims its sections as part of its territory. And because it's got sovereignty, it says over that land, it also claims the maritime zone. But that map, um, wouldn't be accepted in relation to Antarctica by most other countries of the world. So just focusing in on it, Australia's Antarctic uh, exclusive economic zone is shown in mustard there. And Australia has three permanent bases in Antarctica, Mawson, Davis and Casey. And within that, there's a whole range of other um, countries of established bases. Um, just south of Davis, there's two large Chinese bases and then Vostok in the centre of Antarctica is a Russian base. It's famous for, does anyone know why it's famous? Related to climate change? The Vostok ice cores are very famous in climate um, science because essentially scientists were able to drill down through the ice, the glacial ice, and basically for a mile, and pull out a huge ice core going back about 800,000 years in terms of the Earth's uh, atmospheric history. So the Vostok ice cores are a really important um, part of some of our evidence for past uh, climatic changes. I'm going to focus in on a little section here, the Shackleton ice shelf. So in Antarctica, you can see that little wavy blue line, can you? I can't really because my glasses, I don't have my glasses on, but there's a little wavy blue line. Then in lots of Antarctica, there's an ice shelf extends out. So a glacier goes out past the landmass, out further than the land. And um, I'll come back to the shackle and ice shelf. So talking about whaling, there's a lot of different whale species. Um, the big whales like the blue whale and fin whale and um, bowhead whale and right whale, they were basically wiped out by commercial whaling uh, last century up until the 1960s and 70s when there was a moratorium in the 80s on commercial whaling. So the bigger species were all pretty well wiped out. The smaller ones though, particularly these little ones called minkies, and you can see a little, so in terms of whales, minkies are pretty small. Having said that, if we had a minky in the room with us right now, we wouldn't have much room for us, so size is relative. Um, but minkies were relatively small and so not really a target of the whaling vessels because they were so small, they went after the bigger whales. Uh, now it's important to remember those different species when we now talk about Japanese whaling. So there's different estimates for what they were before the you know, original population and what they are now. So blue whales were pretty well wiped out and are very slowly recovering it at all. So you know, there's a lot of problems for blue whales still. Um, minkies may have actually increased in numbers because the other big whales were all taken out. Um, there's debate about whether they actually increased in numbers but, um, and there's debate about what the total numbers are but there's hundreds of thousands of them. So when commercial whaling was, a moratorium was imposed in the 1980s, Japan continued to whale minkies, but not the bigger ones. And its argument was that it was sustainable, there was lots of them. In fact, they call them the cockroaches of the sea, there's so many of them. Um, and basically the argument was, you know, we should be allowed to have sustainable use of any marine resources. So they weren't just, when we talk about whaling by Japan, it wasn't just any species indiscriminately, including critically endangered species, there were some species that were really not of concern in terms of um, their endangered sta status. So uh, after the moratorium was imposed, Japan continued to use the previous commercial whalers to carry out what was claimed to be research. So for years, it sent down a fleet each 
uh, southern hemisphere summer, so around about now they would have been down in Antarctica whaling. And the fleet was made up of um, the three vessels at the top were the catchers. So they're the ones that have actually got a harpoon on the front. They go out, they're fast, they're small, they go out, chase down a whale, harpoon it, and then um, uh, kill it, bring it back to the research ship, which is the one in the middle, the Nishin Maru, where the whale is then transferred to the research ship and chopped up. And then down the bottom, there's two, those two white ones, they, they're not fitted with harpoons, they were the sighting vessels, they would go out and find the whales, and then the catchers would go out and kill them. And then, because they were down there for months, and they couldn't be resupplied, Australia and New Zealand, the two closest countries where they were whaling, basically were opposed to what they were doing. Uh, in fact, if one of those vessels came into an Australian port, they could be arrested. Um, but basically, they avoided Australia and New Zealand. They used, used to sail around the east of New Zealand, go down. They were down there for so long, though, they had to be resupplied. So they would send down a vessel called the Oceanic Bluebird, which would go down, pick up a whole heap of whale meat, resupply them with fuel and food, and then they could continue to whale, and then they would sail back. Okay, so as part of their reporting about what they were doing, so they were saying they were doing it for scientific research, they would produce reports which they would deliver, and this is basically showing from some of those reports where they were killing whales. So about... 15 years ago, a conservation group approached me and said, look, they're whaling in Australia's waters. It's illegal under Australian law. Can we sue them? So we took these reports and we drew in Australia's EEZ and then basically counted the number of dots within Australia's exclusive economic zone and what was the Australian whale sanctuary and counted them up. And they came to several hundred just in their own reports. And then we went to court in Australia to sue the company that was carrying out the whaling. And um, essentially we were using domestic courts uh, to, in part to put um, pressure on the Australian government to take stronger action. And uh, yeah, I won't go too much into the details of that, but essentially these are some of the pictures from that are gathered together as part of that litigation. So this is a picture taken uh, of a minke whale just after it's been killed. I've actually seen film footage, which I couldn't find um, when I went back and looked for it, but um, there's film footage uh, taken of this minke whale. So they kill them by shooting them with a harpoon, which is called a cold, he cold head grenade exploding harpoon. So it basically goes into the whale and then explodes and basically the, the um, concussion destroys it internally. So the whale in this was sort of struggling about and then suddenly it just, all this blood comes out of its blowhole so it's been killed. Um, if, it, if they were still struggling, they would also shoot them with a high-powered rifle. In the footage of this, this was actually a mother with a calf beside it and they were racing trying to get away from the whaling vessel and they took a number of shots at it until they finally got it. Uh, and this was, we were able to pin down as being approximately 40 nautical miles within the Australian whale sanctuary. This picture is actually taken from a helicopter, that Greenpeace. Um, you know, it's a nice little bird's eye view. Um, Greenpeace was down there harassing them at the time and basically trying to document them. And then after Greenpeace, in really the last 10 years, the Sea Shepherd became much more aggressive in going down there and trying to get in their way. Greenpeace was relatively passive in the way that they went down and documented what was going on. This is a picture, as I said, taken. this is taken from a Greenpeace helicopter um, and it's that whale that in the last image you saw is killed and you can see the harpoon flying through the air as the mother tries to get away. And then once the whale is killed, they tie it up to the side of the um, catchers and drag it back to the Nishin Maru and you can see here some Greenpeace um, uh, boat trying to get in their way and the um, whale is spraying them with water hoses. And then similarly, this is the Nishin Maru, and the water cannon's going. This is again a picture from Greenpeace. And so the catchers would transfer the whale to the um, uh, research vessel that would drag it up. And you can see the lines going down in the water. That was to stop Greenpeace vessels coming in too close because they, their propellers could get hooked up in the rope and they're spraying water cannons. And they've even got a sign there because they know that Greenpeace is taking pictures 
Whales are not endangered, Greenpeace misleading the public. And then this is again a picture from a Greenpeace helicopter, uh, another helpful sign, we're collecting tissue samples. And my thought is there's a hell of a lot of tissue samples there. So that's a Mickey whale being chopped up. Okay, so how is this whaling in Antarctic waters regulated under international and national laws is a question I want to unpack. So let's think about the sources of international law to start with. Again, this is a fundamental concept for our whole course. So where does international law come from? There's four sources that are normally identified in the Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, which is often cited as the, as the core reference. But the two most important ones to be aware of are international conventions, also called treaties. So international agreements. And then international custom as evidence of general practice accepted as law. They're the two ones to really be aware of. And international conventions is the vast bulk of international law. Um, but custom remains important. In fact, the whole concept of sovereignty is based on custom. So there's two criteria for determining whether customary law exists based on state practice. And firstly, there should be um, consistent state practice, uh, constant and uniform usage, and also that that practice exists because of a belief that it's required by law. So if you think about sovereignty, sovereignty at its heart is, that it is a right to control territory. And so in Australia right now, uh, so we're all in Australia and we are subject to the Australian system of government. The Australian government has sovereignty within our system of government. So we're in Queensland, so uh, the Queensland government also has sovereignty within this territory. So it can apply laws to us and we are subject to them within this territory. And countries... Um, elsewhere would recognise Australian sovereignty as applying in where we are right now. So, for instance, if um, uh, you know you were to commit a crime today in, in Brisbane, you know you assault someone or you stole something, you could be even though you're from another country, you can be charged under Australian law and be sent to jail, and you know the full implications of the law applied to you because Australia has sovereignty. Um, the laws of other countries generally don't apply where we are. They can if, you're, if there is a, enough of a link to the country. Uh, so if you're a citizen, for instance, of another country, there might be laws of that country that apply to you wherever you are in the world. But generally the laws that are applicable here and now in this classroom are the laws of Australia. And that's based on sovereignty. So sovereignty is a, a core concept um, of our whole system and it's something that's important to be aware of in terms of customary international law. But mostly in our course we're going to look at conventions. So the general, where can you find them? Well, um, they all have good uh, home pages. So um, for instance, if you just search for the Whaling Convention, you'd come up with the uh, website for the um, uh, International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling, and it's got a rich source of documents and details about the implementation of the treaties. There's also a UN treaty collection, but it's much less useful. Really, the old treaty collections were useful before the internet, when you know you had to go to a library to find you know documents and it was difficult to get them, so treaty collections were really important, whereas now you can just go onto the internet and get an actual copy of anything you need and you know, lots and lots of documents. Okay, so if we do that uh, for the International Whaling Convention, we could go to their website, iwc.int, and there's a whole heap of information there. Now, I want to use this to unpack how is a treaty created and administered and I've given you a handout with this diagram on it and this is probably the most useful diagram, useful part of the course um, really just for your general knowledge and for your future careers is actually all contained in this little diagram. So basically this diagram summarises the whole process for creating and administering a treaty. 
So if we start at the left, um, negotiations commence when basically countries recognise there's a problem they've got that they can't solve themselves, so they need help from another country, and they're going to agree on what they're going to do in terms of cooperation. So there's some problem that they need to solve and they need to work together. So they want to reduce it to writing, what they're going to do. So that's the normal reason for why countries get together to negotiate a treaty. So they can negotiate um, the text of the treaty and those negotiations end when they agree on a text and they sign the treaty. So there's an important second stage though uh, to a treaty actually becoming binding. It's called ratification. So what happens with signature is, okay, it's a little bit of, an, of um, a historic artifact because now we know, you know, you can pick up, everyone here is going to have a phone, you could call someone in the US right now and talk to them or China, you just dial their number, you'll get straight through, you can talk to them. But that's only happened really in the last few decades that you could do that. So treaties have been negotiated for centuries. So if you were, for instance, uh, say the government of France and you wanted to negotiate an agreement for trade with the US government and you send a delegation to uh, the US, they could be away for weeks or months and you've got no contact with them while they're away. So you send away a delegation, they agree to a text and they negotiate it on your behalf but if you're the king or the government of the country that sent the delegation, you just don't want to give them like a free reign. So there was an important second step, which was called ratification. So they would agree on a text and then they would bring it back to their country and the government uh, of that country could look at the text and think, do we actually want to agree to this? Is this what we, you know, what we agree to be bound by? And if they did, then they ratified it. They deposited an instrument of what was called ratification. So ratification was a crucial second step and a country wasn't bound. So there's some famous examples of countries that, for instance, have signed but not ratified a treaty so aren't bound by it. And the really famous ones involve the US. So there's the United Nations Convention on the Lure of the Sea, signed in 1982. The US signed it, but because of the US system where the Senate basically has to vote to, uh, if there's a treaty that imposes obligations on the US, the Senate has to um, vote in favour of, in favour of it by a two-thirds majority. The US Senate has been hostile to essentially the UN and international law for decades. And so the US government has never been able to ratify UNCLOS this massive treaty of real importance for international maritime law, the US has never ratified it because they can't get it through their domestic processes. So the US government has never been able to ratify. Uh, similarly, the Kyoto Protocol, the US signed, but then wasn't able to ratify because the Senate wouldn't um, agree to it. So ratification is a critical second step. And the different processes are different in different governments. On the bottom of the, that handout I've given you, I haven't got it in the text here, but I've summarised some of the ratification processes in Australia and the US. Um, the ratification processes are different in different countries. Like in Australia, uh, the government, our federal government, doesn't need to put it before parliament and have it approved. They typically do but it's really only a courtesy, it's not required by our system. A, an Australian government of the day can sign and just decide to ratify it. They don't need a vote from the parliament. It's different in the US and different in a range of countries. So if you're from a different country uh, other than the US or Australia, if you don't know the system of ratification, I'd suggest you look it up. I'm sure you can easily find it. So what is the system that's required within your country to approve a ratification of a treaty and it varies around the world. So ratification is a really important term to be aware of and that's, as I said, why sometimes countries have signed but then not, are not bound by it because they haven't ratified it. Um, then you go on to entry into force and entry into force occurs 
The rules are different for different treaties. It's not just a majority of countries that have signed it. Um, it varies depending on the subject matter of the treaty. So, for instance, when we look at treaties about uh, pollution from ships, most of those treaties are based around countries ratifying it that have a certain percentage of the gross um, international registered shipping fleet so that uh, essentially the, the treaty only enters into force when most of the fleet of the world is captured by the countries that have ratified it because you know there's not much point say Switzerland ratifying um, a, a treaty about shipping when it doesn't even have a coastline uh, so uh, as opposed to say you know a country that has a lot of ships um, registered in it okay so different rules for entry into force and then once a treaty enters into force so it's binding on everyone that's ratified it or every party that's ratified it they then periodically have meetings uh, and they can have you know a whole range of exchange of information but they they typically have regular meetings they might be annual they might be every two years or every three years so the convention on biological diversity is every three years uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is every year, so it's uh, just about to, s to start. So it's always at the end of the year in different countries. Uh, and so um, they're called different things under different treaties, but the most common term is called the Conference of the Parties, so COPs. And then they often get a number, depending on how long they've been going on to. So I think for the UNFCCC, we're up to COP 25, is it? Yeah, so one for every year. So that's the basic process. And there's a whole range of things there that are hopefully useful for you in understanding basic things about treaties. I won't dwell any further on that. We'll keep talking about it. And you know, once we've talked about a number of treaties, um, I'm sure if it's confusing now, it'll actually make a lot more sense. So um, a common question that crops up on the exam is explain the normal process for creating and administering international treaties. Use a diagram if it assists your explanation, but supplement it by explaining and writing the steps provided, sorry, steps involved. Provide an example of a major international environment treaty to illustrate your answer. So it's basically that diagram. And what you'll see when we look at the exam is a lot of the questions really are just asking you about these sort of fundamental concepts because they're the ones that I really want you to hone your understanding of to remember because they're the most useful for you going forward. So the exam is really not just about giving you a mark, it's really about hopefully focusing you on the most useful things to take from the course. Okay, so if we're looking at a treaty, another thing that I've given you a handout on is how do we interpret it? So if we've got the treaty, we've got to read it, it's, it's in words, how do we interpret it? Well, there's three main steps. I've summarised it on your handout. The first is uh, ensure that you have the treaty in force at the time relevant to your problem and it's been ratified by the country that you were considering and actually entered into force for that country. Normally that's pretty easy. Uh, treaties generally don't change their text too much. They tend to have broad agreements that are made and then the details are worked out in subsidiary agreements. So for instance, we've got the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change signed in 1992. The text doesn't change, but there's subsidiary agreements like the Creator Protocol, the Paris Agreement, which come after. So, um, but for instance, if you're looking at the, yeah. Anyway, that's the first step. Second step is, I'd suggest skim read it. Um, and identify the parts relevant to your problem. And then thirdly, interpret the parts of the treaty relevant to your problem in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning given to the terms, um, read in their context and in the light of its object and purposes. So basically plain meaning, but in good faith. And that third rule comes from, I'm giving you on the handout, that third rule comes from um, Articles 31 and 32 of the Vienna Convention. So if you see on the back of your handout, you'll see Articles 31 and 32. So there's a a treaty called the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which is a, a, a central reference point for how you interpret treaties. Uh, so good faith, read it, plain meaning. Okay, and we'll, we'll practice that now with an example of interpreting the um, International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling. So can I just... Actually, I'm just going to open up. 
a copy of that. Okay, so giving you it on a handout, and as I said, this is the only treaty that we're going to uh, actually look at. Actually, open as the hand that I've given you. So, um, this is a really nice little short treaty, but you can see everything um, that normally occurs in a treaties. So, you see the start in that first column on the left. Governments whose duly authorised representatives have subscribed to here, recognising the interests of the nations of the world in safeguarding the future generations of the great natural resources represented by whale stocks. This is the preamble. As I said before, treaties typically set out the problem they're designed to solve in the preamble. So, the background, really. Okay, and then articles. And often treaties will start with some definitions. So articles um, uh, two uh, has some definitions. But artic article one says that the convention includes the schedule attached to it, and basically they're integral. The schedule is integral to it. Then there's a definition of in article two factory ship land station. Um, whale catcher and contracting government, so really brief definition section, but that's really common. Um, then they're establishing the machinery for how the treaty will be interpreted, or sorry, administered. So Article 3, the contracting governments agree to establish an international whaling commission, here and after referred to as the commission, to be com comprised of one member from each contracting government, each member shall have one vote and may be accompanied by one or more experts and advisors. And they'll elect. So this is essentially a set, setting up the um, secretariat, but also the voting um, for the uh, treaty. So essentially, um, under the Whaling Convention, they don't call meetings, they don't call them a COP, a conference of the party. They call them a meeting of the International Whaling uh, Commission. And that International Whaling Commission, or IWC, every contracting party has one vote. So it's, it's a conference of the parties. It's just not called that under this treaty. So you get the basic rules. And then um, the commission may either, in collaboration or with independent agencies, etc., gather data. Commission may um, amend from time to time the provisions of the schedule by adopting regulations with respect to the conservation and utilisation of whale resources. And a bit about that. Um, so it's Article 5, links to the schedule. And then what happened in... I'm just going to go to the schedule. I've just given you an extract from it. The schedule was amended uh, in the early 1980s to prohibit C number six there. The killing for commercial purposes of whales, except minke whales taken with cold grenade harpoons, shall be forbidden from the beginning of the 1980 slash 1981 pelagic and 1981 coastal seasons. So this is the moratorium on commercial whaling brought in in the early 1980s. Um, later, it was also included minkies, but at the time, it um, yeah, excluded them. Um, so that was the moratorium. It's brought in in the schedule to the whaling convention. But Japan relied upon Article 8 of the treaty, which says, notwithstanding anything contained in this convention, any contracting government may grant to any of its nationals a special permit authorising that national to kill, take and treat whales for the purposes of scientific research, subject to such restrictions as to the number uh, and subject to such other conditions as the contracting government thinks fit, and the killing, taking and treating of whales in accordance with the provisions of this article shall be exempt from the operation of the convention. And each contracting party shall report once to the commission what, you know, it, about permits. Um, any whales taken under these special permits shall, so far as practical, be processed, and the proceeds shall be dealt with in accordance with the directions issued by, issued by the government. So Japan, so there was a moratorium brought in in the early 1980s, but Japan relied upon Article 8 
to say, well, we can give a special permit for research. And looking at the text, they had a really good argument that what they're actually doing was lawful. In fact, my thought was that it was lawful um, because that what they were doing, if you interpret it in good faith, um, it looks, you know, they've got a very wide discretion to issue permits. Countries that were opposed to whaling said, you're actually issuing permits for invalid reasons because you're not really interested in race research. This is really commercial whaling in disguise. But it was a dispute about the, the interpretation of Article 8. Japan always relied upon Article 8 to overcome the, the prohibition on commercial whaling and saying it was research. So that went on for several decades. And then uh, I'm going to come back to, there was a court case about that in the International Court of Justice, which ended up ruling that what Japan was doing was unlawful because it went beyond what was needed for scientific purposes. Um, but um, just want to look at the last few other articles. So we've got an, uh, an overview of an entire real convention. Um, article... Nine, each contracting government shall take appropriate measures to ensure the application of the provisions of this convention um, basically carried out under operations by vessels under its jurisdiction. So essentially, contracting parties then have to implement it into their national legal systems and into vessels that they are registered and crews that are coming from their jurisdictions. So international law like this applies and binds countries. It doesn't bind you and I. So if you decided that you wanted to go out and kill a, um, uh, let's just say you decide this weekend to go out and kill a um, humpback whale that's you know going along um, beside um, North Stradbroke Island and you go out and you, you go out in your dinghy, you get a big um, uh, spear gun, <laughs> good luck, um, but you harpoon a, a, uh, a um, uh, humpback whale and you kill it and then you drag it to shore and you cut it up and, you, and then you want to go and sell it. Okay, So you're engaged in commercial activity. Have you breached the International Whaling Convention? The answer is no because it doesn't apply to you. It applies to Australia. And what Australia has done is enact domestic laws that make killing whales or cetaceans, whales, dolphins and porpoises, illegal within Australia's um, maritime zone and the Australian Whale Sanctuary. So you would be arrested or charged with breaching Australian law for killing that whale. You haven't breached the International Whaling Convention, but you've breached Australian domestic law. Does that make sense? And what Australian law in basically prohibiting killing of whales within its waters is doing is complying with Article 9. And then last few articles. Article 10, this convention shall be ratified and the instruments of ratification shall be deposited with the government of the United States of America. And so this is, remember this is 1945. So what about a country that comes afterwards? So ratification is, um, you know, you've got to sign it and ratify it. That's pretty simple. But there's also um, a process where countries can accede to a convention. Where is that? Can't actually see a session. So typically if you come after and you haven't, you weren't part of the original parties that signed it, you can accede to it. I can't see that looking at it. But also there's um, Article 11. Any contracting party may withdraw from this convention on 30th of June in any year by giving notice uh, on or before 1st of January. And Last year, Japan um, withdrew in frustration over the refusal of um, the bulk of countries that were parties to the convention. The, the bulk of countries refused to allow it to carry out commercial whaling. Um, Japan withdrew from the convention and then from the 1st of 30th of June, it was then not bound by the convention. So Japan is no longer a party to the International Whaling Convention and it's carrying out commercial whaling in its own coastal waters. So it's withdrawn. So here you see essentially all of the major parts of a normal treaty. Um, some def you know, a preamble, some definitions, 
some mechanisms for rules to be set or some obligations. And this, this treaty is really just a framework convention. It sets up the, the way that rules can be set and then it allows the International Whaling Commission to decide them and that's linked to the schedule. And then there's also a way that parties can ratify and the convention, ent the convention enters into force. Um, this is the entry into force. Um, at least six signatory governments have ratified it, so that's the rule for entry into force. And there's also a process for countries to withdraw. So they're all the major elements of a normal treaty. Yes, any questions? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, and similar, uh, they're depositing an instrument, but it's called, um, yeah, just withdrawal. So Japan's done that, um, essentially just depositing with the, um, the government or the secretariat um, its instrument of withdrawal. So that's what Japan did. So it's similar. Countries relatively rarely withdraw from conventions, so it's, but it's, it can happen. And normally a treaty will set up those sorts of mechanisms because a country, it's typical because countries don't, you know, they go into these uh, often cautiously and if they decide that they no longer, they want to be bound by it, they want essentially an escape hatch. So that's essentially the escape hatch built into it. You don't sign up to it and then you're bound forever. You can withdraw. Okay, so going back to Um, just the slides I had. So we talked about the moratorium and the schedule. Can I just unpack a few things around this um, treaty, but also treaties generally? So some common actors and institutions, whenever we, not just for this treaty, but generally, um, there's the common for most treaties are, we call them parties to the treaties, but they're often called states as well. So you'll see a state. And when, when we're talking about a state under international law, you're talking about the country. And it can be a bit confusing in countries like Australia and the US where you have a federal system of government where we've got a national government and then state governments. But when you're talking in international law and you, you see a reference to a state, in a, like an Australian context, it's not talking about Queensland, it's talking about Australia. So the state is Australia in our context, or China, um, the nation, the national government, um, and they can become parties to the treaty. Um, the Conference of the Parties are COPs, or other decision-making body for the treaty, so there's the International Whaling Commission. It's a COP, but it's called the International Whaling Commission. Uh, there's typically a secretariat which, you know, hosts the website. It normally does administrative things like, say, if they're going to meet in, say, um, a particular city at a particular time, the secretariat will book the venue and ensure that, you know, there's security and all of those sorts of things are done. So the secretariat does that and then the parties all show up and they have their meeting and the secretariat does the facilitation, but it's the, the countries themselves which vote and make decisions, not the Secretariat. And similarly with the um, UN Charter, like the UN Secretary General, he's the head of the, effectively the Secretariat, um, but he doesn't have a decision-making power uh, for like the General Assembly, so the Secretariat. And then there's all, often non-government associations that go along, they don't have any legal powers, but a lot of countries bring them along to be part of their delegations. So Australia might take a range of conservation groups to a whaling commission um, meeting. Okay, in terms of other actors and institutions, um, so we talked about the UN already, the UN Security Council, UN General Assembly, United Nations Environment Program, the IPCC, the World Trade Organization, International Court of Justice, there's a whole range of these international bodies. Um, I've mentioned that you know there's 193 members of the United Nations. There's about 196 countries in the world, depending on how you count them. Uh, so Vatican and Kosovo um, recognised, but not members of the UN. 
Taiwan is not recognised as a member of the UN since 1971, but it is an independent state, disputed obviously by mainland China, um, who sees it as a renegade province. But uh, so it's not a party to most conventions, uh, and yeah, most countries don't recognise it. Regional groups can also be important. So things like the European Union that you're familiar with, but there's some others that you mightn't be familiar with. So, so uh, Mercosur is the southern common market in South America. Um, so the UN has grown over time since it was formed in 1950s. It's grown you know, to recent years to cover a lot more countries. And now one country is trying to break away if it can ever decide what it actually wants and what it's going to agree to on the, on the breakup. So a, a very uh, difficult um, process for the United Kingdom to leave um, the EU. So Mercosur is the southern common market. It's an economic and political agreement between Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay and Venezuela. Um, and Bolivia joining in, so significant for South America. In Southeast Asia, ASEAN is a, another important um, uh, regional body. I just want to flag this for you. I'll talk more about it when we talk about the UN um, Framework Convention on Climate Change, but there's important parties or voting blocs uh, in international negotiations. So the most significant is the G77 in China. So the G77 was founded in 1964 when there were 77 members. It's now grown to 130 odd members, but it's still called the G77. And essentially it's made up of developing country blocks, and so plus China. So um, yeah, G77, it's, and within it, um, these aren't actually subgroups of China. I've just grouped them because all of the all of uh, the Africa group is obviously made up of the group of all African countries, the Alliance of Small Island States or AOSIS is made up of about 43 low-lying countries like Tuvalu that are particularly vulnerable to climate change, and they've been a very powerful voice in climate change negotiations. There's also the LDC group or the least developed countries. These are 50 very poor countries, and they are given special assistance under the UN system. So those aren't technically subgroups of the G77, they're actually different groups. I've just grouped them under the G77 because all of those groups, all of their members are all members of G77, but I'm not suggesting that they're, it's a subgroup of the G77. Does that make sense? Okay, so G77 is important to be aware of. Uh, the European Union, 27, soon to be 26, um, important, um, very rich, uh, very progressive in many ways for international and human rights issues. There's some other groups, we don't need to worry too much about them, but G77 and the European Union are, are two. So they're important because they go along and they vote typically as a, as a voting block. So, um, and while a lot of the agreements work on unanimous voting, the block system is still important because you know obviously if G77 is going to go a particular way, They've, they've got a majority, like if there's 130 countries in it, then they're already a majority in the UN General Assembly, just the G77. So it's obviously a very important voting bloc. So here's a map of the members of the G77 in China, currently 134 members. Okay, in terms of the IWC, there's two distinct voting blocs. Uh, there was the anti-whaling bloc, which is the US, Australia, New Zealand, the UK. And then there was the pro-whaling bloc, which prior to with withdrawal this year, Japan was a member of, but Russia and others were also members of it. There's a big problem with um, buying votes, uh, and it was notorious within this system, but it's pretty notorious in a lot of international systems that rich countries uh, buy votes. Um, so, um, yeah, Japan uh, was notorious for essentially buying votes of you know small um, Pacific countries you know donations would be made to the the Pacific country for you know something and they would lo and behold they've got no real interest in whaling but they show up and vote as part of Japan's block so they give them one more vote um, and you know if you're looking at a system where a majority can actually make a change then buying votes can actually be an effective way of 
changing what's allowed. Uh, so yeah, a whole range of documents or, or you know documentaries on Japan, basically using aid, uh, and we're talking about whaling here. Other countries use it in different you know in different ways. China at the moment, with its um, Belt and Road Initiative, um, you know, uh, providing aid. Uh, and then getting international support from countries, uh, and obviously the US. Um, my view is, I know coming from a perspective where I'm Australian, but my, my view is Australia doesn't tend to link its aid to support in an international way. It tends to basically provide aid with not so much um, strings attached. But at the same time, aid provided by Australia, countries will be reluctant to go against Australia you know, if they're receiving significant donations from it. And so it's been notable where South Pacific countries that get a significant aid from Australia have basically been criticising Australia openly for our lack of action on climate change in recent years. OK, so aid is you know, a real part of the whole system. Just mention... Um, it's right at one o'clock when I wanted to break for lunch, but can we just go on for a few minutes and then we'll wrap up and we'll take an hour for lunch? Okay, so uh, I just mentioned... So the court case that I was involved in was it started in about 2004, 2005. It was in the lead up to... It was under Australian federal law and we use the federal court in Australia down in Sydney seeking an order to restrain Japanese whaling under Australian national law. A big part of it, why it was run, was to try and pressure the Australian government to take more action. Um, it didn't get decided until 2008, and in just before it was concluded, there was a federal election, and the Howard government was replaced by the Rudd government, and Peter Garrett was the Environment Minister, and in the lead-up to the election, the Rudd government said that the Howard government was letting Japan whale in Australian waters in breach of Australian law, so basically piggybacking on our court case and criticising the Howard government and calling on them to take stronger action and stop the Japanese whaling. And so when the Red government won that election, we were really hopeful that they would actually send some ships down and arrest the Japanese whalers. Unfortunately, um, a lot of Rudd promised big and then delivered small. And so when he got into government, they sort of pulled back from actually stopping the whaling in Australian waters and instead went off and started a court case in the International Court of Justice to basically have a ruling that Australia's, sorry, that the Japanese whaling was a breach of the International Whaling Commission. And um, apparently they had, I didn't think they'd win. I, like I thought Article 8 gave Japan a strong basis for arguing what it was doing was lawful under the International Whaling Commission. And um, some cables that came out from a leak from a US government a few years ago suggested that the Australian government also had a very bleak view on its prospects of winning. Um, but it went to the International Court of Justice uh, in The Hague, this beautiful building, this incredible... Um, here's um, lawyers presenting an argument to... typically has a bench of like 15 members of the International Court of Justice, so a lot of judges there's lawyers presenting actually in the whaling case in 2013 and um, judges listening to it. This was uh, the Australian team preparing. So they sent over, Australia spent about $20 million in this court case. This is the team basically preparing arguments going into court. It centred on the interpretation of Article 8, which we talked about, but essentially I thought Japan would win, that on the face of it, interpreting it in good faith on its plain meaning, Japan could pretty well do what it wanted in terms of issuing permits for research. Australia attacked what Japan was doing, though, and saying it actually wasn't carrying out research. I didn't think they'd win, but they did. So the International Court of Justice decided that basically the, the whaling that was being carried out went beyond what was required for research, and therefore what Japan was doing was unlawful under Article 8 of the Convention. And... Yeah, taking as a whole its program can be broadly characterised as scientific research, but it goes beyond what's reasonable to achieving its stated objectives. So essentially what they were doing was unlawful. Japan said it would comply with the judgement and reframe its um, 
program. So they reduced the number that they were going to take from 800 to 300. And um, I won't go into the details, but um, essentially Japan then reframed it. But then it ultimately grew really frustrated that the IWC was re refusing to allow commercial um, whaling to resume. So in late last year, Japan announced it was going to leave, withdraw from the IWC. It deposited its withdrawal agreement and basically from the 1st of July of this year, it is no longer a party to the IWC, so the International Whaling Convention. Um, it's no longer whaling in Antarctica. It's, there's some whaling in its coastal areas. Um, and yeah, so they removed the word research from the Nishin Maru. This is just a news report from the 2nd of July. Uh, and so there's commercial whaling now um, in Japanese coastal waters. So just building on that, this broad question, do politics play a role in international law? So what do you think? Why does Australia, for instance, oppose Japan whaling? Like particularly if you, if you just say, well, okay, we focus on minkies, they're not gonna kill anything that's in danger, but there's a lot of minky whales and all they wanna do is kill, kill minkies. Um, it's, let's accept that it's sustainable. We kill a lot of other things. Why can't we, they kill minkies? Like, why does Australia oppose Japan killing minkies? Or why did it? Public perception. Public perception? Yep. Because <laughs> whales <laughs> have this great PR mechanism now. They send all their, like, all those humpbacks that come up the East Coast and do little flips and, you know. And also the, the great thing is they don't eat people. So I've been involved um, in a case about shark drum lines in the Great Barrier Reef. And we won a case um, earlier in the year about getting shark drum lines taken out of the um, Great Barrier Reef. But um, sharks have a big PR problem. You might have noticed uh, uh, it involves a lot of blood. Uh, and so there's a lot of public hostility to sharks uh, that whales don't have. So whales, they're really, they're PR wizards. Uh, and so there's a lot of public support for them in Australia. Um, similarly, in Japan, as I understand it, there's also a lot of, still a lot of domestic support for whaling. There's historic and cultural reasons for it. Also, there seems to be the baggage of not wanting to be told by other countries what it can and can't do. So there's the, you know, don't tell us what to do, we're going to do what we want um, component. But it's domestic politics that, you know, sending the research vessels down to um, Antarctica never made commercial sense. Like the cost of it far outs exceeded what they actually earned from it. So Japan was subsidising it. Why would it do that and, and, you know, get all of this international criticism? Why? The domestic politics was really the driver for the Japanese government. Similarly in Australia, why should we care that Japan kills a few um, small whales that aren't endangered? Domestic politics is the answer. You, did you want to comment on uh, that or yeah, add to it? I just want to say something to save the face of Japan. No, no, I'm, I know, <laughs> no, don't, please don't feel... I'm, I'm using j the Japanese whaling as an example. And yeah, I mean, there's plenty of... Like, when we get to climate change, I'm going to be roundly criticising Australia. So it's not... I'm just I mean, using yeah. it as an example. Just mm -hmm. because it's smart or cute doesn't make, how do I say, its position in the hierarchy like high, higher than like other animals. Or, yep. like, I, I mean, I don't really understand why people still eat sushi but not like accept eating whales. Yeah, or, or cows or, yeah, 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 or yeah. other things. Yep. So. I mean,
Yep. Look, I'm going to accept that. Um, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, you can certainly argue both sides of you know the whole whaling debate. And Japan, I really wanted to emphasise, Japan wasn't going after critically endangered species. It was going after a species that was relatively common. And its argument was, um, look, these are just marine resources. We should be able to use anything sustainably. As long as it's sustainable, it should be OK. That was the primary argument for it. And then you, know, you get into the whole sort of whether whales are special because they're smarter uh, argument. And Japan would normally point to, you know, well, you still eat cows um, or some other species that's also quite smart. Um, what's, why do you eat cows and, you know, complain about us eating whales? And I don't think we can answer that here. Um, what I really want to emphasise on, though, here is the positions of the countries and what they did internationally was driven by the domestic politics. It wasn't a logical, re you know, there wasn't really a commercial reason for Japan in going down to Antarctica and whaling. It was more a domestic political thing. Similarly with Australia, what harm was it doing to us? Not much. Um, but there was a domestic political thing. And, you know, we were having this fight each year with, which, with a country that was, you know, until very recently our biggest trading partner and also is still our second biggest trading partner. You know, we'd have this fight, political fight. Why did we have that fight with, you know, someone that you know, we, we trade with so much? Um, and it was domestic politics is a simple answer. OK, so politics is really important. Um, what about sovereignty? Um, sovereignty is really important in all of this, and I'll keep coming back to it, and we'll talk more about it in UNCLOS particularly. But outside of its territory, a state is generally restricted to controlling activities of its citizens and vessels or planes registered in its territory. So uh, at the moment, so you're in Australia, you're subject to Australian law. You might be subject to the law of uh, another country if you're a citizen or you're engaging activities that might affect that um, country. So, but sovereignty is really important. And then similarly for Antarctica, Japan didn't recognise Australian sovereignty in Antarctica. So there's a whole argument about whether Australian law could apply or not to stop Japanese whaling. I just mentioned that in Antarctica, there's also now a whole system that's built around the Antarctic Treaty system. I'll talk more about that in a, in a couple of lectures when we talk about the Antarctic Treaty. Actually, the next lecture, I think. Um, that's pretty well it. Taken points from this lecture. So we've looked at context, UN Charter, Whaling Convention. Uh, Five taken points from this. There's two principal sources of international environmental law, treaties and custom. There's a typical process by which treaties, treaties are negotiated, agreed, ratified, enter into force and administered by the conference of the parties. The, th the main principle for interpreting treaties is to interpret the parts of the treaty relevant to your problem in good faith in accordance with their ordinary meaning. Fourth, politics play an important role in international law. And yeah, finally, there can be a complex interplay between international and national laws, their relationship between them. OK, if you wanted to read anything more, there's a few chapters of some of those textbooks. But you could go and have a look at the ICJ website. Um, if you wanted to, there's a whole heap of resources available there. You don't need to for the purposes of our course. But if you wanted to, heaps more there. OK, so that's the end of uh, our lecture. Let's take an hour for lunch. So it's a quarter past one now. How about we come back at quarter past two? Does that sound OK to you guys? So um, I'll be around for the lecture. So if you want to leave laptops uh, or anything in the lecture room, there'll be someone here all the time. So if I'm going to leave, I'll ask someone to stay while I go. So if you want to leave your laptops and the like, they'll be secure here. Cool.